Hello and welcome to Awesome Astronomy episode 23 for May 2014 and this is a special treat for us because we're delighted to be recording this from as close to a spiritual place as either of us could imagine. We've been kindly invited by the curator of the Herschel Museum of Astronomy to this wonderful house at 19 New King Street in Bath, England, which now serves as a lovingly restored Georgian house and museum to the life and times of William Herschel and his family. And this is the place where the astronomer, musician and all-round polymath William and his sister Caroline lived from 1777 until 1784, with one period away when William Herschel became the King's astronomer. And it was from the garden here that the Herschels discovered the planet Uranus in 1781. He discovered that many of the double stars in the sky were binary systems and made, well, so many incredible discoveries of the night sky that we're going to be talking about later in the show. But first, I'm Ralph, your host for this month's show, and it's my proud honour to let loose upon us all this child in a sweet shop and <laughs> worshipper of all things Herschel, Paul. Hello, um, I could not be more excited, as anyone who knows me will understand. I mean, if amateur astronomy has a spiritual home, then this is most certainly it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I mean, there are many places that can lay claim yeah. to be important um, in the world of astronomy, and Greenwich in London, the Hotel de Cluny in mm. Paris, Mount Wilson in California, to name but three. But those are all centres of professional astronomy, or vast, imposing places, and what we have here in Bath is a terraced house like many thousands that are found up and down the UK. Um, and out the back is a little garden that many listening will recognise. I mean, it's an observatory just like yours. Sky partially blocked out by the house and surrounding buildings. Light pollution ever present. No dome. Just a yard like any other. And it's here that astronomy took a great leap forward. And it was in the hands of an amateur. And in a sense, it's always seemed to me that this place gives amateur astronomers hope that they too can not only look at the wonders out there in the night sky, but also contribute to astronomical knowledge. Yes, I think so too. Not that amateurs stand much chance of discovering any new planets, if there are still any out there in our solar system still to be discovered. They'll be far beyond the orbit of Pluto and only observable with vast professional grade equipment and finding planets in other solar systems would prove even further out of the reach of amateurs. But this wonderful museum and the history of the Herschels does remind us that there are still ways that amateurs can contribute. And I'm thinking specifically that despite the big expensive sky survey apparatus run by professional astronomy consortiums and organisations, Many asteroids and comets still get discovered by amateurs today. Jupiter doesn't have an orbiter currently snapping away at it, so new cloud features or asteroid impacts can still be seen first by amateurs. Yes, and, and don't forget the crowdsourcing contribution of amateurs as well, finding exoplanets in the Kepler data or cataloguing galaxy types on Galaxy Zoo. <laughs> yeah, because what amateurs have got on their side is sheer numbers. That You know, there's hundreds of thousands of people looking up or using astronomy crowdsourcing software every minute of the night and day. Yes, and in many ways it is here at 19 New King Street in Bath that this begins, a house for a professional musician from Hanover who one day hires a telescope and decides he can make a better one. <laughs> OK then, so let's take a look around the museum and explore all the exciting equipment that the Herschels and Georgians of that period used. Absolutely. Let's go in after you, sir. So a beautiful Georgian house, and it really is just like any kind of Georgian house of the period that you'd see in Bath or certain parts of London, up and down the country, really. Absolutely. And the first thing, of course, that jumps straight at you is the seven-foot telescope. Yeah, the iconic telescope that yeah. William Herschel would have used at this location in which he discovered Uranus with. Yeah, and I mean, this is a replica. This is uh, has been built by a member of the, the, the trust here, but has been created using one of the originals as a, as a template. And when you look at the construction, which is, it looks like a beautiful piece of furniture, but yeah. it doesn't look like modern day telescopes because it had to be built out of these uh, original... Uh, materials, the the wood and the, the mirrors had to be ground by hand. It's not mass produced like it is today and the, the idea that somebody could actually spot a new planet, find a new planet that's as faint as Uranus is with a piece of kit like this, I certainly yeah. wouldn't want to be trying to do that with a telescope of my own. No, no, not at all. And, and the kind of mount it's on, I mean it's... Um it's pretty Heath Robinson, isn't it? I mean, it's, it is, it's, yeah. it's pulleys and string and little brass handles, but just looks stunning. And we've got right next to this, the, the seven-foot telescope, we have uh, a scale model of Herschel's 40-foot telescope, which, sitting in the reception, shows you just the scale of this vast machine he made and, and how it was possible to even create something on this scale, this giant 
pyramid of, of, of wooden construction and then this huge pipe of a telescope mm. sticking out <laughs> with <laughs> with Herschel just sitting at the top looking down the tube <laughs> I mean it it's it's a vast thing I mean it was it was so large it was considered one of the the wonders of the, the modern world at the time and even appeared in the modern survey map and it just does show the given that Herschel started out as an amateur astronomer and became probably one of the first professional you would call astronomers mm. The, the dedication that he had to be able to, to, to create something like this, nothing on this scale had been done before. No, I mean, you can see the team of people working various pulleys and levers to, to, to actually make the thing work while he sits up there looking down at the mirror. Um, just incredible. Yeah. Okay, so we've walked now into the dining room, and here we have uh, a reproduction of a, of a typical Georgian dining room. Um, the table apparently is from Observatory House, is original. But the rest of the furniture isn't, but is of the period. But one stunning object, of course, is the chest. Which really is quite stunning. We've got the initials on the top, WH for William Herschel. And this was a wooden trunk that belonged to William Herschel. And it was where William kept all his papers. So in here was stored all the notes of the great discoveries that he made. This is how William Herschel kept his records. And a real piece of history that we're absolutely privileged to be part of right mm. now. And on top is his specimen box. Now, this demonstrates that, that William wasn't just an astronomer. I mean, he was actually a professional musician, but he was also a polymath. He was interested in other natural sciences. And here is his little sample collection box with some beautiful little drawers. And you know, Ralph's just opening one up there. And it's just a stunning little object, um, which he would have gone into the field and collected insects and stones and anything that took his fancy, really. And I'm looking over here, Paul, at something that I think you're going to absolutely love because we've got a planisphere of the time which looks like it's been, well, it will have been, it'll have been drawn by hand, cut out by hand using a knife. And this is something that astronomers even today use uh, in great quantities to, to chart their way around the skies and, and find things that they're going to be looking at. But I imagine this has got a lot more of a historical bent to, uh, to please your eye, Paul. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a collector of planispheres. I, I'm still one of those people who... who shuns the, the, the modern technology yeah. of, the, of your smartphone and, and turns to a, well, mostly plastic now. But here, I mean, this is just a really beautiful object of three layers of, of three discs of paper pinned together. And the star map, I mean, is, well, it's really odd. I mean, it, it's, it's not a star map that's easy to, to recognise. You can see the Milky Way has been drawn on. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the division. But actually, they haven't drawn out constellations that we necessarily would recognize entirely there are there are constellations that we no longer recognize as constellations and also interesting to see that the milky way is on there when these will have been drawn from cities or the edges of cities where now light pollution has just got yeah. so heavy that nobody would see the milky way from most of these places yes i mean this this one says it's uh, published in london uh, i can't ever <laughs> imagine seeing the, the milky way from london in fact probably half those stars in fact and we'll take a, a wander up the stairs now Yes, I mean, this is a, and actually, I mean, quite a typical terrace house, but actually quite a large one. I mean, it's on five floors now. The bottom three floors are the museum, and I think the top two floors are now rented out as, um, as accommodation by the museum. So we're walking into the main room of the house now, and this is what we would now call a, a standard living room. I mean, it's very ornate because it's of the period. But um, in here, William Herschel would have conducted the majority of his work, and his work at that time was, of course, music. He was a musician. Yes, and quite a famous musician at the time. I mean, he was uh, employed by uh, a nearby church. He was the organist. And he's composed many pieces of music that were very famous at the time. From this room, we get a lovely view of the garden. Now, we'll, we'll come back to the garden in a moment. But, uh, of course, this is the famous garden where all the discoveries were made. And as we look around this room, we can see many of the letters and notes that talk about those discoveries and next to them, some of the really fascinating objects like the eyepieces used and the mirrors. And one of the things that really stands out to you is just this fascination that they had at the time with comets. Yes, I mean, this it's uh, an obsession of the age. Um, it, was, it was only in 1758 that Halley's Comet, well, it wasn't called that at the time, but the prediction that Halley's Comet would, would return was proved. And, of course, then the search for comets was the great astronomy obsession, um, Charles Messier being the prime example. But we've got some absolutely fascinating objects here. There's um, letters and notes by Caroline 
with diagrams too. We've got pictures of what look like comets here. Well, actually, they look. It looks more like um, a moving globular cluster. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the fact that it is moving shows that it's either a diffuse asteroid or it is, in fact, a comet. And we've got these wonderful handwritten notes where um, Caroline initially would have been inside having observations shouted to her by William out in the garden. And she'd be making rough notes to yep. then write out in a much oh. more structured format the following day. And they really are quite beautiful. It's, it's fascinating. Dear Sir, August the 1st, in the evening at 10 o'clock, I saw an object very much resembling in colour and brightness, the, a nebula. Except this object being round, I suspected it to be a comet. And there at the bottom is a diagram with two stars, um, well, three stars actually, one moves out of the, the eyepiece, and then you've got this little fuzzy blob that, that moves. I mean, this is authentic original observations of comets that have never seen, been seen before. And these would have been observed from not far outside London, where today you'd be lucky to see a comet that is as, as <laughs> yes. dim as that looks by comparison to the uh, the field stars that are there. And looking around in the cabinets here, we've got so many more handwritten notes, particularly on comets. Comets seems to have been um, just as fascinating to the Herschels. And of course, we know that Caroline Herschel herself was quite prolific when it came to discovering comets, and it was a, a real passion of hers. And, um, I mean, there's a second edition um, Isaac Newton optics book here. Um, wow. Reflections, refractions, inflections and colours of light. Um, <laughs> and this would have just been lapped up by astronomers of the day. Absolutely. Um, and to bring it more up to date, um, we have here um, part of the Voyager space camera, which, of course, passed Uranus in 1986. Um, next to a collection of lenses and eyepieces, which would have been used by Herschel to find a Uranus in the first place. And what's really interesting about these is that they look so primitive and the glass is so small as it would have to be to create lenses of any quality. They'd have to be really small in those days. But they also look like uh, eyepieces that today you'd really struggle to use to be able to see anything. And the faint objects oh. that they were detecting with these is just astounding. As, as an observer and sketcher, I mean, I, I am full of respect for, for the people who use these eyepieces because... Mm. They look eye-watering, frankly. I mean, there, there is no eye relief on any of them. No, there's not. And, and, it, and imagine having to, to grind the lenses and the mirrors yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just incredible how they were right on the cutting edge of, of astronomy as, it was, as, it was, as we know it today and as it was being born. And we can see just over here in the other side of the room that there are some mirrors that have been hand ground that have been donated by the Royal Astronomical Society to the Herschel Museum. And they really are in incredibly good shape given the age of them. These are, these are from the period. And we have all sorts of uh, globes and maps of the moon. The, the, the moon globe is incredible. I mean, it's, when you think this is, this is one, of the, one of the first made. I mean, 1797, uh, John Russell. Uh, who's a friend of Herschel, um, and the, the level of detail from visual observation through a telescope that, of the kind that Herschel was making, uh, and it's all hand-drawn, I mean, it, it is a stunning, stunning map, and uh, to my eyes, very accurate. I imagine as a keen lunar observer yourself, you mm. would have found that, you, well, you'll be very impressed with that. I'm extremely impressed with that. I mean, I, I, I spend time drawing craters on the moon, and I know how long they can it can take to, to <laughs> get any sort of accuracy, and to see this, and... It has all the major craters of you know, the, the visible part of the moon. Just incredible. And beneath the moon globe, we've got this wonderful brass drum orrery, which really puts itself in the time frame, because although we can see here that it was made in 1785, two years after the discovery of Uranus, what we have is, well, it's quite evident. There's no Neptune on this. Um, and you notice that there are just the inner planets, the gas giants, we can see the ring around Saturn made out of ivory there, and the, the outermost planet is Uranus. This is just two years after the discovery of the planet by William Herschel here in Bath, and, um, and would be presumably one of the, the first orreries, certainly of, uh, of this beauty, that would have been made after the discovery, and, and to include Uranus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we move, move into the music room, uh, which is sort of part of, part of this, this floor, um, and it's just filled with just stunning objects of the period, uh, including organ pipes and the keyboard that Herschel actually played um, at the octagonal chapel nearby where he worked. Sitting there, though, is a brass telescope. And that is absolutely stunning, isn't it? Yeah. And this is the kind that he hired originally, which is what when he first became interested in, in natural sciences and astronomy. I mean, he, he hired a telescope. 
and I think this is what spurred him on because it was mm. very unsatisfactory. He he found he couldn't use it very well. It wasn't particularly the optics weren't particularly brilliant. Um, he had a very disappointing experience, which I think is, is sort of common among many people who start <laughs> in astronomy. So um, he decided to decide build them himself and see if he could do a better job. Decides of it. to make them himself and makes a well does make a far better job of it. Yeah, to the extent that he started building telescopes for kings and queens and important people from around the world that he, uh, William Herschel became the go-to person to get hold of the, the top grade equipment after the Astronomer Royal Masculine actually said that they were better than the, the scopes. Yes, that, um, I mean he, he, they thought he was a loon when he, he described <laughs> Uranio and some of the things he was show, saying in his telescopes, I think people thought he was a bit of a lunatic, you know, some, some amateur in a, in a small provincial city um, and when he proved his telescopes I mean he masculine says he's, he's making the best telescopes in the world far better than the, the Royal Observatory had in, in their possession and on the wall above the square piano and the brass telescope we've got an engraving or one uh, one of only two prints of an engraving showing the distinguished men of science of Great Britain and what this is is it's a uh, an engraving that's very similar to the, the famous American portrait of the Declaration of Independence with all the prominent people all lined up so that you can see who they are quite prominently but in this case it's all the wonderful men of the age the people that really drove on the Industrial Revolution and put Britain on the map in terms of its scientific distinction so just looking at, across it we've got William Herschel who's uh, sat right at the front on the, on the left-hand side, and we've got people like Henry Cavendish, John Dalton, there's Isambard Kingdom Brunel. James Watt. <laughs> um, we've got uh, Cartwright, we've got Trevethick. Um, just all, the, all those names you've probably yeah. heard about in uh, learning the Industrial Revolution at school when you were, you were 13. Um, and here they all are. I mean, they, they never did stand in a room like this, but it just, just uh, demonstrates the, the era that they all lived in and just how quickly things were moving. This and the age kind of, of scientific enlightenment. Exactly. Most interesting thing about it, though, there are no women in the picture. Yeah. Uh, next to the picture, we have a dress of... Caroline Herschel. Yeah, an original and, dress of hers. Yeah, original. then it, the first thing that strikes you is just how tiny the woman was. She, she was very, very small. Um, but she is one of the great figures in astronomy. Um, the, the first professional female astronomer, pro first professional scientist. Yeah, exactly. In an age when, as the picture shows, women just didn't do that sort of thing. Yeah, when, when they did do anything like that, it was as an assistant, but Caroline Herschel became so prominent in this, as I said earlier, discovering comets and um, and really driving on. And in fact, she was quite accomplished at the uh, the grinding of mirrors, so making the, the equipment herself. Mm. And, um, and following that, she actually got a wage from the king of 50 pounds a year, which in those days would have been a phenomenal amount, and making her, of course, the first professional female astronomer. Yes, and we'll be talking more about Caroline with the curator of the museum in the show. So let's go downstairs, shall we, and we'll go and take a look at the workshop where the Herschels made their equipment and the garden where they did their observing. Okay, so we're moving down into, well, the, the basement, really, of, of the house, and this is where the, the sort of engine room of astronomy um, in, in the Herschel camp was. And we move straight into a flagstone floored kitchen, which is of the period, and straight through the door there into what would have been the Herschel's workshop. And we've got a furnace, we have the equipment for grinding mirrors, we've got hand pumped bellows. And what really is quite striking about this workshop is the amount of technical knowledge that would have been required. And don't forget, this is a person that's making observations by night. He's also entertaining people with the music. He's writing music and teaching people music. How we found the time, I yeah, just don't I know. I mean, and he was originally uh, an army musician in, in the Prussian army. Um, and so he's, even English is not his native tongue. So, you know, he's in... The, it's in quite a, incredible, isn't it? In, in essentially a foreign country, although, you know, he becomes naturalised. He's, he's not... He's not of England. He's not of England. <laughs> Um, and if, I mean, right in the middle of this this workbench is the the just an incredible piece of equipment, isn't it? I mean, it's it's engineering, it's it, precision engineering. Uh, There's cogs and teeth. Wouldn't quite know how to go about designing it in the first place, no. but it, it's a way of grinding a mirror by hand. Um, and I just give you it a little turn that. here. You can hear that. Here we go. Round and round we go. Um, and I mean, Herschel used to sit at this, grinding this with with as constant speed as possible. For, for hours, hours, if not days. Hours and hours and hours. And, and people would put food in his mouth. I yes. mean, he would get his sister to, to put food in his mouth so he, he didn't have to take his hands off polishing the mirror to make it perfect. Because, of course, as soon as you stop, 
you, you, you're going to create an issue on the mirror. So yes. you've just got to keep going if you're going to make these perfect mirrors, which for the time he was. The, the, the best mirrors around, yeah. And it's not just the polishing of the mirrors as well. He actually created his own mirrors. That's not mirrors like today. This is creating his own alloys made of, well, it was called speculum at the time. It's still called speculum today, this mixture of copper and tin. But also he used to create his own concoctions to make them better. So we would have zinc, we'd have and you'd think arsenic in it, yeah. yeah. And, so um, dangerous conditions Yeah, and as well. we've got this furnace, this sort of replica of the furnace here. And what's so striking about it is it's very rudimentary um, and would have been, frankly, dangerous to use. I think if we've, today we, we'd not, not create anything quite like this. But it's the floor. The floor is... Well, it's astronomy history, isn't it? I mean, yes, the flagstone floor. That's the, it's completely broken up. It's got cracks all over the place. And this is from 1781, an incident where the speculum went wrong. Um, he got the mixture wrong with, with his assistants and it blew all over the floor, caught fire. Um, and Caroline records, apparently, that um, she was in the garden at the time where she spent a lot of her time, which, <laughs> given that the house was a telescope workshop, like, I don't, don't, full of noxious chemicals and people planing wood, I don't blame her. Um, but she records the, the smoke pouring out of the workshop and, and William and his assistants running out into the garden um, to escape. And we are standing on the floor that was broken by that, that failed attempt at making a mirror. And wonderfully, it didn't daunt them. They carried on making their own equipment and went on to bigger and better things. Yes. Now, we're moving into um, what's, what's actually a new gallery. This has been added to the house. And it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful little um, glass room that's been put on the back of the house. And in here are some of the just incredible artefacts from the time, um, including things like a guest book um, that Caroline used to keep or the people who used to visit. Oh, this is wonderful. It, it's just incredible. The list of people on here, the Polish <laughs> ambassador. Um, who else have we got on here? There's We've got the Duke of Orléans, Duke of Queensbury. Uh, interestingly, it says a gentleman, two ladies. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Princess Royal, um, Neville Maskelyne, the, the astronomer royal there, on the, the 23rd of December. <laughs> the Russian ambassador and company, Lord Bristol, Bishop of Derry, Professor Schneider of Strasbourg. And this just shows how famous the Herschels became. Um, I mean, this, this book is actually from Slough, um, when they had been employed by the king to become the, the, the sort of his personal astronomer. Um, and so they became part of the Herschels. You know, this is how famous they were. They, they became part of the royal entertainment, that if you visited the king in Windsor and at Slough next door, you, you went to visit the Herschels as well. They were, they were part of the, the sort of royal event, the royal tour. And this is a period from 1790, uh, February in 1790, until October the same year. And this is just one page of a list of dignitaries that came along. And we can see in the book that there are pages and pages and pages. So they got visited by a lot of people and became very, very famous in their own right. Yeah, and it's surrounded by just, just the most marvellous objects. I mean, there's, there's the mirrors, more, more of William's amazing mirrors. And the, the two at the bottom, I mean, they, they are still so reflective. And when you consider that, you know, they're over 200 years old. Um, and while, yes, they've been looked after, just how well they were made and how well they were ground, that they are still probably not good enough for astronomy, but still incredible mirrors. But it can't, yeah, it can't be underestimated just how advanced mm. these were for their age, and they were hand ground yeah. just here. Yeah. And right next to these mirrors, although this isn't related to the Herschels, we've got this wonderful chunk of a nickel iron octahedrite meteorite, which is a chunk of the solar system from 4.2 billion years ago. And it's just something else that you can see in this museum. And I mean, we've got another case of um, Caroline's notes and, and letters here. Um, it does show just how productive she was and, and how thorough she was and wonderful yeah. elegant handwriting oh, it's, too. it's beautiful and very readable actually mm -hmm. um, which is uh, unusual in, in historical documents and there's a wonderful letter here from 1805 where she says last night I popped upon a comet. <laughs> it's visible to the naked eye between Fomalort and B. Seti. Fantastic. Yeah, it's just wonderful, these handwritten notes, and it's just so yes. elegantly written, and, and in that informal style there that would have been a note from the night that, that, it, was, that it was seen, and then the next day she'd write it up in a, in a, a more coherent form. And on this shelf, we've got Flamsteed's um, star catalogue, um, which of course is Caroline's. Probably one of her greatest contributions is she rewrote this, because it was their work showed that it wasn't very accurate. There were actually lots of problems with this this catalogue that was considered the best of, of yeah. the era. And, and that so showed just how advanced she was as well. She went through it and 
an incredible piece of work. I did we'll talking more about that. We'll later, be talking more you? about that later, and just just improved on this catalogue, and, and here it is. And there's a Wonder Woman comic. <laughs> yes, there was Wonder Woman. Um, again, showing. I mean, I think how important Caroline she appears in a Wonder Woman comic from from 1952. Um, and there she is. Uh, there's a, a sort of Wonder Women in history, um, and here is a page of Caroline Herschel, uh, and there she is in a in a comic, an American comic book. Yeah, good to see that she's being recognised not just here, where in 1950s she probably wasn't recognised to the same no. extent as she no. is now, but in America they appreciated it. Okay, let's move on into the garden. Ooh, yes. After you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, and I mean, we're very lucky actually. It's what a glorious day! It's beautiful, isn't and, it? And the, the, the flowers are out, the sun is out. Um, just a, a stunning little Georgian garden. I mean, recreated, um, but of the style and the, of the, the sort of correct sort of planting. And apparently, Caroline was was very particular about her garden. It was, mm-hmm. um, I think with all that speculum going on inside, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not surprised <laughs> she spent a lot to get of time away from the vapors, maybe. <laughs> but it also just shows just how much like a normal home this is that they were making these wonderful discoveries from. Yeah, and, well, here we're standing. Here is a marker to demonstrate where Herschel was standing when the seventh planet was discovered. And towards the back of the garden, we've got a sundial that marks this place where Uranus was discovered. In the middle of the garden uh, is a a brilliant piece of, 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 well, modern art, um, and it's... uh, I th- how to describe it really? It's it's a ball, but like an explosion, isn't it? I yeah. suppose there's sort of yeah. lots of little little metal poles coming out of the centre, and the fascinating thing about this is it's the size of Uranus. If Jodrell Bank, the big radio telescope, the big radio telescope up in up near Manchester, was the sun, and it's in the correct the correct place by a sort of wonderful bit of, of coincidence, mathematical coincidence. So it's you, scaled down. You can scale it, yeah, and yeah. And, and Uranus ends up in. Bath. I mean, I'm not sure exactly <laughs> how how accurately it's placed, but Uranus would be about where Bath is if Jodrell Bank was the sun. And so here, you know, so with Mars and Jupiter and Pluto and all put uh, into other places exactly, in, in the UK when it, Pluto was a planet. It's part of a, a bigger sculpture, and there are other objects like mm. this dotted around the country that, that sort of represent the various other planets in but the what solar system. What a beautiful system. coincidence as well. Yeah, wonderful. And that's our audio tour of this incredible place. We've not captured anything like as much as we'd like no. to be able to bring you, so <laughs> you'll just have to come for yourselves. But we'll be talking to the curator of the museum later in the programme, but now we'll go over to the news. And we start with more exciting news this month about the already fascinating moon of Saturn, Enceladus. And Enceladus, along with one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, really is starting to steal the show now in terms of places where life could exist in the solar system. And probably up until the two Voyager spacecraft took good quality images of Europa in 1979, Earth and Mars were seen as the only realistic places where water could exist for long enough for life to form. But... With a deep ocean underneath the thick ice on Europa being detected by the Galileo spacecraft in the 1990s and the Cassini orbiter's ongoing exploration of Enceladus, we're seeing that these moons around the solar system's gas giant planets may well be intriguing places to go and look for life too. Yes, and Enceladus really only came onto the radar in 2005 when the Cassini spacecraft detected water spewing out of cracks near the the moon's south pole. And that gave us another moon, this time around Saturn, to get excited about, Um, you know, because like Europa, there must be water under that icy surface. Yeah, and we now have a team from Sapienza University in Rome looking at how the movement and speed of the Cassini orbiter changed as it flew past Enceladus. And these minute movements, these changes in the speed of Cassini, tells them how dense regions of the moon are and incredibly allows them to deduce more about its interior. Yeah, and it's it's more good news in the hunt for life, or certainly the condition suitable mm. for life. Um, the news is getting better all the time. Yeah, that's exactly right. They've deduced a solid rocky core with either a small sea beneath the ice in the southern hemisphere or lots of water pockets that are feeding the water geysers that Cassini spotted back in 2005. And it's not certain that it is water, but the orbiter's changes in speed as it encountered Enceladus's gravitational field show that there's something more dense than ice and less dense than rock, making water pretty much the only sensible option. 
But in the search for life, we don't want the water pockets to be the correct model. We want a sea or a large lake, one that runs from the rocky ground that would provide chemicals and nutrients all the way up to the cracks in the 50 kilometres of surface ice. Yeah, you can make a good guess that this isn't going to be the last we hear about Enceladus from Cassini. I, th I think we're going to get a lot more news as long as Cassini is allowed to keep orbiting. Yeah, and I think they've confirmed they're going to deorbit Cassini, that's crash it into Saturn's cloud tops, unfortunately, in 2017. Yeah, such a shame, but sticking with Cassini and Saturn, we've got a great discovery hiding among the outer rings. Oh yeah, and this is so cool. I mean, seriously, you sent this over to me as a press release, and I was reading it, and it was just getting more and more interesting. <laughs> when I read on. It was good, wasn't it? So cool. So this is Cassini again, orbiting around the Saturn system, and the spacecraft's in what's called its solstice mission, where it's taking a closer look at the rings and some of the moons. And in fact, it's currently, as we're speaking and as you're listening to this, making flybys of Enceladus at an altitude of less than 75,000 kilometres. That's one-fifth the Earth-Moon distance, so you can bet that we will be getting more news on, well, Enceladus that moon soon. But that's not the moon that we're interested in for this discovery, because we've spotted a small brighter region and a disturbance in the normally uniform circular pattern right on the edge of Saturn's brightest rings, the A-ring. And NASA scientists think they're seeing the ice and dust that makes up the rings clumping up in this region to try and form a tiny moon about half a mile across. Very small and unlikely to get any bigger, but it's also migrating outward from Saturn, like the models of moon formation suggest. So we think we're actually watching the birth of a moon that's ultimately doomed to break up and die before it really achieves any substantial size. Yeah, we can't underestimate the importance of this. Mm. Uh, being able to watch it happening rather than modelling it based on orbital mechanics, it, it's something really special. Uh, also shows the importance of space agencies extending their missions um, if the spacecraft have the ability to keep going. Yeah, I mean, just just think that Cassini was originally only planned to run from 2005 to 2008, and there was no guarantee of having any, any extensions. Yeah, and if they hadn't extended the mission, we'd have missed discovering the moon Aegean, um, those huge storms in Saturn's upper atmosphere. Yeah, and the vortex in Titan's atmosphere, because mm. both of these storms help us to map their climates too. Yeah, we've had so many more flybys of larger moons, and now the rings. I mean, we just don't know what cool stuff's going to show mm. itself until it gets beamed back to NASA. Yeah, and the, the real icing on the cake that we really want is an orbiter and a probe for Europa and Enceladus, but they're going to be decades away if they happen at all. Oh yeah, I mean, but there are the Europa lander plans on mm. the table, so you never know. Uh, so that's Enceladus and a possible new moon, so what's next? Uh, we're going to go back to an exoplanets news item that we didn't get the opportunity to talk about in previous episodes. Yeah, I'm glad you're going back to this one because it's it's a big deal, um, but it got bumped out of the last couple of shows when the astronomy world went mad with new discoveries. <laughs> yeah, it did, didn't it? And not only that, but it shows that although the planet-hunting Kepler telescopes hasn't been operational for a year now, it's still collected tons of data that's still being gone through by astronomers, and every mm. time we find a new technique of analysing the data, it can all be sifted again and more results drop out again. And that's what this is, a, a new method to sift the Kepler data and confirm more planets in the candidates that it found. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, until May of last year, Kepler could stare at 160,000 stars all in one, all at one time in the constellations of Lyra and Cygnus and look for tiny dips in the brightness of stars as planets passed in front of them. And so far from the four years that it was operational, Kepler has found some 3,800 planet candidates. And are some of those still eclipsing binaries? Well, I guess some of them must be, because this is a task that astronomers have. They've got to look at the stars that show a regular dip in their light, as they would if a planet kept orbiting in front of it, and then subtract the ones that are caused by these eclipsing binaries, where a two-star system is lined up from our point of view so that one star passes in front of the other. The faintest star in the pair can look identical to an orbiting planet, and that needs to be determined before we can confirm that a planet is actually there in the Kepler list of candidate planets. And that's why they get called Kepler objects of interest until they're confirmed by other methods of finding planet candidates, um, like direct imaging uh, or the radial velocity method, uh, where they look for the stars wobbling. Um, and now there's a new method of analysing these candidates that's just taken Kepler's tally of confirmed planets to... 961. And if we add this to the planets confirmed since we first started detecting them in the early 1990s, we're now up to 1,772 confirmed exoplanets as we record this. So just for a bit of fun, we can do a roundup of the most interesting planets beyond our solar system that we now know exist. 
Okay, and in number 10, the planet with the longest orbital period was directly imaged around a star of Firecus in 2011 and takes 1,000 Earth years to complete one orbit. It's non-mover at number 9. The first ever confirmed detection of a planet outside our solar system came in 1992. But not around a main sequence star like ours, no, but around a pulsar, PSR B1257 plus 12. Moving down the place to number 8, the hottest known extrasolar planet scorches away at more than 7,000 Kelvin. That's as hot as the star Altair. A new entry at number 7, the star with the most known planets out there is Hipparchus 7599 in the constellation Hydra, a nine planet system, one more than our own. Sorry Pluto. <laughs> and slipping down three places, last week's number 4 is Kepler 37b, the smallest known planet out there, barely larger than the Earth's moon. Another non-mover at number 5 this month, PH1b. This planet, found by amateurs using the Planet Hunter Citizen Science Project, is a planet inexplicably existing in a four-star system. Just imagine all those sunrises, mate. Nice. A new entry steaming into the charts at number 4 is NY Virginus B. At 27,000 light years away, this is the farthest known exoplanet sitting at a similar distance away as globular like cluster M92. That's a long way, mate. Creeping its way up the charts to number 3 is Galice 667 CC in Scorpius. With three suns, this planet almost twice the size of Earth is the most habitable of the confirmed exoplanets. But with four times the gravity, make sure you take regular rest breaks to catch your breath. <laughs> and just missing out on the top spot for the third month is Alpha Centauri BB, orbiting the nearest star system to Earth, just 4.3 light years away. It's also a similar mass to the Earth, but orbits much closer to its sun than our own scorched world, Mercury. If Voyager were going in the right direction, it could get there in just 76,000 years. And clinging on to the top spot is the weird and wonderful PSRJ17191438 b Once a star in its own right that died and cooled as a white dwarf before losing mass to its binary pulsar companion, it ended up as a planet, one and a half times the mass of Jupiter, made of solid diamond. Not a... So now we come to the five minute concept and this month it's something of a unique privilege for us as Paul tells us about the observation of the seventh planet from the very spot it was discovered 233 years ago. In March 1781, on the spot where I'm sitting now, the solar system doubled in size. It seems remarkable that it was in this quiet urban garden behind an unremarkable terrace house that a planet was discovered. A planet over 14 times the mass of Earth, orbiting out in the icy depths of the solar system. A planet to the present day that presents us with more questions than answers. For as long as people had looked up at the sky, there had been five wandering stars. Fleet-footed Mercury, bright dazzling Venus, red Mars, the king Jupiter, and the slow-moving god of age and wisdom, Saturn. The Babylonians watched them. The Greek astronomers set them in spheres and epicycles. The Romans renamed them, while the Renaissance set them in their true orbits. Century after century, however the solar system was laid out, it ended with a 30-year orbit of Saturn. 1,433 million kilometres from the Sun, making its languid way through the zodiac. In 1781, it was sitting in a ficus next to Mars, and not far from Jupiter, sitting in Libra for what must have been a spectacular early morning triple conjunction. But in this garden in Bath, planets were not the aim of the night's observations. It was double stars, as they had been since 1779. Using a 6.2 inch aperture 7 foot focal length F13 Newtonian built in the workshop behind this house, Frederick William Herschel was hunting for parallax. Beside him, taking down the observations, performing many of the calculations, was his sister Caroline. Night after night, they pursued a holy grail of astronomy, the observation and calculation of the distance of stars. Parallax is a simple idea, and one that your own brain uses all the time in order to judge distance and perspective. Holding out your finger on an outstretched arm, and closing each eye in turn, you'll observe that your finger appears to move relative to the objects behind. Your eyes act as two independent and separate observation positions, allowing your brain to calculate distance and provide you with a three-dimensional view of the world. In astronomy, the separate observation positions are provided by the movement of the Earth. 
The Herschels, like many astronomers of the era, hoped that by observing stars at different times of the year, tiny amounts of movement would be seen relative to other more distant stars, and therefore calculations about the distance and size of the universe could be worked out. They weren't wrong, and it's interesting to sit here and gaze into the sky where the European Space Agency have just placed the Gaia satellite, which will map a billion stars, essentially using this method. But in 1781, the instruments that could measure parallax were beyond even the skills of William Herschel, who, by all reckoning, probably had the best telescopes in history to that point. Herschel, though, still searched, and decided his best possibility was to look for stars that appeared to be close to each other, so-called doubles. Here, thought the Herschels, was the best bet for measuring the parallax that had first been proposed by Galileo Galilei at the beginning of the previous century. So in 1779, they began a systematic search of the sky for pairs of stars, Caroline keeping meticulous records. Caroline Lucretia Herschel is often forgotten in the story of astronomy, and she herself declared once that, I did nothing for my brother, what a well-trained puppy dog would have done, that is to say, I did what he commanded me. This does not scratch the surface of her achievement, both in cooperation with her brother and on her own, eventually with her own telescope. Eight comets and galaxy M110 are among her list of independent discoveries, but perhaps her work away from the telescope is her greatest contribution, for it was Caroline, not William, that improved and redrafted John Flamsteed's star catalogue, the standard of the day. She highlighted the errors, created a better index, and added 560 stars not recorded. All astronomers that followed owe Caroline a debt. Her catalogue of stars was one of the bedrocks of astronomy in the 19th century, and indeed beyond. The Herschels, particularly through the mathematical and writing graft of Caroline, placed accuracy at the heart of the science. Not bad for two self-taught amateurs. The double stars they hunted surprised them. First, there were so many, far more than had been expected. Their search was thorough and their optics the best of the day, and night after night they discovered more stars that appeared close to each other, far more than you would perhaps expect by chance alignment. In a parallel to our present day exoplanet announcements, Herschel began to publish his findings and the count grew quickly. 269 doubles announced by 1782, 434 in 1784, by the time he died, he had discovered over 800 double and multiple stars. But it was the accuracy of the observation that led to the nature of the double stars to be explained. Repeated observations over the years led to calculations that many of these stars had moved relative to each other, but not in a way parallax would explain. In fact, what William had observed and Caroline had written down and calculated was the discovery of multiple star systems, stars in orbit about each other, with a homemade scope in a city back garden, one of the great observations and discoveries of astronomy had been made. But discovery is often full of byproduct and accident, and it was the hunt for multiple stars in March 1781 that led to the doubling in the size of the solar system. One of the great pastimes of astronomers of the day was comet hunting. Charles Messier was so obsessed by it, he created perhaps the most enduring catalogue in astronomy, the better to hunt comets and discount all the hazy blobs and fuzzy patches that kept getting in his way. It was on the night of the 13th of March, 1781, that Herschel noted his first observation that would lead to an enlarged solar system, writing, In the quartile near Zeta Tauri, either nebulous star or perhaps a comet. Four nights later, on March 17th, Herschel looked again for his new discovery. I looked for the comet or nebulous star and found that it is a comet, for it had changed its place. When he presented to the Royal Society, Herschel described how he knew this was not a star. The power I had on when I first saw the comet was 227. From experience I know that the diameters of the fixed stars are not proportionally magnified with higher powers, as planets are. Therefore I now put the powers at 460 and 932, and found that the diameter of the comet increased in proportion to the power, as it ought to be, on the supposition of it not being a fixed star, while the diameters of the stars to which I compared it were not increased in the same ratio. Moreover, the comet being magnified much beyond what its light would admit of, appeared hazy and ill-defined with these great powers, while the stars preserved that lustre and distinctness from which many thousands of observations I knew they would retain. The sequel has shown that my surmises were well founded, this proving to be the comet we have lately observed. But it wasn't a comet, and the astronomer Royal Maskelin suggested that it is likely to be a regular planet moving in an orbit nearly circular to the Sun, as a comet moving in a very eccentric ellipse. The Russian astronomer Lexel and the Berlin astronomer Bode confirmed this, and by 1783 the solar system had a seventh planet, 
and one that at a distance of 2,877 million kilometres and an orbital period of 84 years doubled the size of the known solar system at a stroke and became the first planet to be discovered by scientific investigation and through the use of the telescope. Once accepted, there was of course the small matter of naming the new planet as Maskelyne asked Herschel to do in a letter. Do the astronomical world the favour to give a name to your planet, which is entirely your own, and which we are so much obliged to you for the discovery of. After consideration, Herschel gave the world planet Georgium Sidus, the Georgian star. While planets and double stars are two of Herschel's great contributions from the back garden of 19 New King Street, planetary names are not. And for the interview this month, we're delighted to be speaking to our host for today, Debbie James, the curator of the Herschel Museum of Astronomy here in Bath. Debbie, thanks for inviting us to your museum this month. Well, welcome, and I'm glad that you're here on um, a busy day, um, particularly when we've just opened our new exhibition. Well, we're going to be asking you about that exhibition in a moment, but we can clearly see the love and the devotion that's gone into creating this place or recreating this place. And what was it that made you do it in the first place? Um... The museum was opened in 1981, exactly 200 years after the discovery of Uranus uh, in this garden by William Herschel. We've been recreating the museum over the past decade or so and refurbishing it so that it is very much um, an example of a typical Georgian townhouse but also the home of an astronomer or two astronomers. So we've tried to keep um, the detail um, in keeping with the second half of the 18th century because that's the time when the Herschels were living and working here. So a lot of what you see is a reconstruction but on the other hand it is authentic. And you really can see the cultural details that are going into this. Was that something that was deliberate to make it um, also something that shows the cultural timeline of that period? Yes, it has to. We, we um, basically promote the museum um, on two levels. Of course, it's the home of the astronomers and the discovery of a new planet. But also, it's a typical house, a middle grade house, of the Georgian period at a time when Bath was at the height of fashion. So it very much reflects that element of the Herschel's lives, particularly their musical endeavours as well, because we've got instruments of the period and um, we pay tribute to their, to their musical work as much as their astronomical work. And, and what is your, your favourite part of the museum, the, the, the favourite um, sort of recreation? The favourite recreation, I think, the one I think that's worked best is the workshop. Herschel's original workshop is in that particular part of the building with the original cracked floors, but there wasn't much there which related to Herschel, so we've had reconstructions done of his furnace, his mirror polishing machine and other things to give it a much more authentic feel. And I presume the search still goes on, does it, for more and more items that are attributed to the Herschels and Well, and the indeed. Period. There aren't that many items out there which are attributable to the Herschels. Herschel letters are very rare. We um, tried to get one at auction last year, a letter by William Herschel, and unfortunately we were well outbid. Um, well, people should really be bequeathing these to you or gifting be. them to you, shouldn't um, they? And we don't hear about things that come up that often. There is a nice collection of Herschel material in the Royal Astronomical Society and they're very kind about letting us have loans of letters, yes. work, but all sorts of things relating to the Herschels. But we're always looking for original material and original material to give a better flavour of the, of the house itself. Yeah, and uh, we've seen quite a few of the items that are being gifted to you or, or being on exhibition here from the Royal Astronomical Society. You must have a very good working relationship with those, do you? Um, we do. They're one of our trustees and we've, over the years, we've borrowed quite a lot of material for temporary exhibitions and more permanent displays as well. So let's, let's talk about Caroline. Now, your new exhibition opened yesterday about um, being Caroline. What, what was the inspiration by that? Why, why Caroline now? Well, no particular reason. It isn't a particular anniversary or anything, but we've noticed, particularly over the last few years, that Caroline is becoming much more popular. People want to know more about her, what her life was like, you know, how she did her extraordinary um, astronomical work, and generally about what it was like to be her, a German emigre in this city, 
um, in the very fashionable years at the end of the 18th century and also about her singing career and everything else that went with being the sister of this remarkable astronomer. And she describes herself as, a, I think, a puppy dog um, in one of her, her journals. And do you, do you think that's a, a, a unfair to herself? I think it is a bit unfair to herself, actually. She was much more than um, William's lackey. She was a very clever lady in her own right. Although she had no formal education, she... Um, produced some remarkable work. She recorded uh, nine or eight comets. She made observations for William, recorded his own observations, and put together things like the star catalogue for uh, John Flamsteed, the um, famous astronomer of the day. She, she did a huge amount of work. So she, I don't think, she was a little bit self-effacing, but at other times she was a lot more um, confident in her work. I think by the, certainly by the middle of her life, she realised that she had an extraordinary gift. And there are so many unique and inspiring, I would say, things in this museum. If there were just, say, two items that you say pe you'd want people to see in here, what would it be? That's quite difficult. <laughs> um, Narrow it down to two, yeah. Well, I suppose the um, seven-foot telescope, although it's a replica, it is an exact copy yeah. of the one that Herschel used to discover the new planet. Uh, we have lots of beautiful astronomical instruments, um, but thinking about Caroline Moore, I think some of the letters that we have between Caroline and William are particularly poignant and yeah. interesting, and it, um, I love reading them. So... In a, in a short few sentences, convince people to come to the, the Herschel Museum in Bath. But why, why should they, they make the journey here and, and, and join you in, in this wonderful place? Well, I think they should make the journey. Um, if they know a little bit about astronomy, they're going to get a great deal out of it. If they know nothing at all about astronomy, they will still enjoy it for, for what it is, because it is a beautiful Georgian house with lots of things that relate to the period and um, some fascinating information. I think they would enjoy the garden where we're sitting now, which is beautiful. And really, it's, it's a unique house in Bath. It isn't grand, but it's um, very, very interesting and presentable. Yes, I think we would echo that. I think if, if, if you're in a position to come here and, and look around the Herschel Museum, then do take that opportunity. And thank you for inviting us to your museum today. We've had an absolutely wonderful time. Debbie James, thanks for speaking with thank us today you. on Awesome Astronomy. Well, now we turn to the Q&A section of the show where you can send in any questions you have about astronomy, cosmology or space exploration and there are no stupid questions. If you're wondering something, you can guarantee there'll be thousands more wondering exactly the same thing. So you can email your questions to us using the email address the show at awesomeastronomy.com, via Twitter at awesomeastropod or on the Facebook group. And our first question this month comes from a seven-year-old who already clearly knows a lot about the solar system. Thea Hutchinson, age seven, and I want to know why the planet Uranus spins on its side. That is a great question, Thea, and it highlights a bit of a puzzle because if you look at all the planets in the solar system, you'll see polar ice caps of Mars where you'd expect them to be at the top or the bottom, and if you look at the rings of Saturn or the cloud belts on Jupiter, they look horizontal, they form a ring around their bellies, but it's different with Uranus, which, as you say, spins on its side. And really, we don't know why for certain, but we do have some good guesses. But for whatever reason, this means that the planet Uranus appears to have been knocked onto its side so that the equator and the fine rings that you can't unfortunately see from the Earth circle top to bottom. Now, the most recent theory for how this may have happened came in 2010 when a team from the Paris Observatory showed that an extra moon around Uranus could cause the planet to gradually tilt over millions of years during the early days of the solar system, when Uranus's orbit is thought to have been moving further away from the sun. And this extra moon would then have to be lost because we don't see it anymore. And this can happen over time by gravitational effects from Jupiter or Saturn, which are thought to have been closer to Uranus earlier in the history of the solar system. But the more accepted theory for Uranus appearing to be on its side is still that it was literally knocked over by being hit by one or more of the large chunks of orbiting debris that was much more common in the very early solar system. 
But there is still some debate over whether this was more likely to have come from a single impact from a planet larger than the Earth or by many smaller impacts from large asteroid-sized debris. Because don't forget that the early solar system had lots more debris flying around and small planets competing with each other to thrive. Many of these were consumed by other planets that we still see today and others would have been ejected from the solar system never to be seen again. So while we're here almost every year that the riddle of Uranus's tilt may have been solved by some new research, we still really don't know what happened, and I'm not sure we ever will solve this one. I don't know, perhaps you'll grow up to be an astronomer, Thea, and you can come on the show to tell us how you solved it. Yeah, Uranus, is, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, there are many reasons why it's my favourite planet, but it, its sheer quirkiness has to be up there. I, mean, I just hope I see a targeted mission to explore it in my lifetime. Yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath on that one, Paul. No. It seems to have slipped down the pecking order to the moons of Saturn and uh, Jupiter. But our last question comes from Eric Ems in London, who wants to know about the subject of the Herschel Museum's new exhibition. How did Caroline record her observations? She discovered eight comets and was an independent discoverer of Messier 110. Well, to answer this question, I have with me Joe Middleton, who's the manager here at the museum. And when I hear that question, I think, well, there's no red torches. It's, you know, none of the modern technology mm. we have today. Um, how did she record her observations? Well, it's very interesting because they had two sort of setups, really. Uh, the first one in particular was that Caroline would still be indoors and William would be outside so she wouldn't interfere with his light. And they actually had a rope system. So if William wanted to speak to her about what he was observing, he'd put on the rope. <laughs> right. She would open up, the, <laughs> open up the window, he would shout to her, and then she would record. So she was at the desk with all the, the atlases, mm. all the clock timers and all those sorts of things. And then she would drop them down into a mess book. And then later in the morning, she'd put it into a fine copy and you know double check with William about the positions. I mean, the neighbors must have, must have loved William sh bellowing down yeah. the garden. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And when they had larger telescopes, she actually had a sort of a custom-made shed, so she'd be right close to William. And so once again, there'd be all these different types of signals, ropes pulled, hand signals and bells. And so she'd be sort of tucked away and then she could record all the information. Um, but presumably they, they still sometimes had to... to um, spoil their night vision in order to record. Yes, they, they didn't have well even an idea that red light and. Uh, yeah, I mean they they had. I mean there was times, particularly would say, let's say they're on their own, they would have to pop indoors and out of doors all the time, writing memorandums, checking the clock. So sometimes you know they would have to get their eyes readjusted. Um, but the system they had was, you know, when as a team was pretty um, tight. So so how did Caroline talk about when when she was an independent astronomer herself, you know, with her own telescope. Uh, how, how did she record then? Well, once again, this was a situation where she had a, a very sort of interestingly devised sort of telescope with lots of levers and pulleys. So that would help with her angles and things. But at the same time, she would be sort of, she would have to step away um, from from her telescope and sort of write in every so often. So she was sort of, sort of memorising things as well. So it was sort of back and forth. Mm. And, and how did they keep the time you know sort of in the dark at night mm. you don't have nice nice glowing clock faces like we do today yeah, yeah. how how did they keep that time yeah well actually interestingly they had what was called a monkey clock right <laughs> so and this is another sort of ingenious design which sort of very quietly counted the seconds so caroline if she needed to go and check other clocks and like pendulum clocks inside the mm. house or the library whatever she could still keep track of the time from the distances to and fro so she i mean she must have had an incredible memory and the, the idea that she could should look at time yeah, yeah. And keep that count going. Yeah, but as I say, if she was in her shed, then yeah. she, you know, she was tucked away. And if she was in the position inside the house, then you know, none of this would have really interfered with, with William's observing. Well, and as I say, if she was sort of on her own, then you know, it would be sort of broken up. So the simple answer to the question is um, indoors with a series of ropes, pulleys, bells, <laughs> flags, yeah. and, and a monkey clock. Yeah, and a monkey <laughs> clock, yeah. And I forgot to say the speaking tube. The speaking tube. When, well, she, <laughs> when she was near the <laughs> 40 foot and 20 foot, yeah. Uh, when she was, when they're using the large telescopes, they actually had a speaking tube together. So she, you know, mm. if she needed to come out and help with the instruments and things, um, she could pop out, <laughs> pop out of the shed <laughs> and help William. So where did they get some of these, These, I mean, like the monkey clock? Where, where did that come from? Well, they had a, a secret weapon, which was another brother called Alexander, and he was another great musician in the family, but he helped out with the sort of engineering side of the Herschel's tools and instruments and things, and he actually devised it. And also he helped William come up with the, the polishing uh, turning machine as well to help um, with the polishing of, of sort of larger mirrors. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Joe. That okay. was an excellent answer. My pleasure. And uh, I hope that answers your question, Eric.
Well, that's almost all the time we have for this month, but before we go, I hear a rumour that you're finding new ways to spread the astronomy message, Paul. Yeah, that's right. Um, After 14 years making a living in front of a classroom, I'm going on the road in the guise of serious astronomy. And I know the educational blood's still flowing in your veins, so what have you got in store for the good people of planet Earth? Well, I'll be taking solar scopes and astronomy workshops into schools um, and giving hands-on observing and imaging experiences to children and adults, um, demonstrating the history of the solar system um, and other objects in it, uh, especially getting people to have a closer look at our nearest star. Uh, that's probably going to be as much fun for you as it is for them. <laughs> so where can people find you? Well, it's coming in together as we speak. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter at Sirius Astro, as one word, or email me at paul at siriusastronomy.co.uk. Um, and shortly after this podcast goes out, a website should be unveiled, which will be at www.seriousastronomy.co.uk. So watch this space. And speaking of outreach, by the time this episode is released, we'll have wrapped up the April Astro Camp in the Welsh Brecon Beacons, where we had the BBC Sky at Night team back to film under the dark skies and share a few drinks with us. So you'll no doubt be able to see us on the Sky at Night this month too. And we'll have more Astro Camp in next month's episode. But if you want to book your place for the next foray to Uber Doc Skies with us from the 20th to the 23rd of September, just head over to the astrocamp.org.uk website or follow the link from awesomeastronomy.com. We hope to see you there. Yeah, indeed. So that's it for this month. Thanks again to Debbie and Joe and the staff for hosting us at the Herschel Museum of Astronomy. Don't miss the June Sky Guide on iTunes and the website towards the end of the month or on 365 Days of Astronomy on the 1st of June. But until next time, with the bust of William Herschel looking over our shoulders, it's goodbye from... Bath. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins, Paul Hill, Damian Phillips and John Wildridge and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more astronomy news, views, help and advice, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Yeah, and, well, here we're standing. Here is a marker to demonstrate where... Herschel was standing when the seventh planet was discovered. And there's a, a sundial in the towards the back of the garden around a, a quince tree arboreum. Arboreal, yeah. Arboreal, 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 Arbore